morning to all of you. My name is Naomi Paskovic. Thank you so much for joining us today and for attending the 2016 E2E Convergence event. Uh, our purpose today really is, is to work together, to collaborate on ideas and strategies as uh, we gather together as representatives of colleges and university, uh, industry, government, uh, not for profit organizations, to ensure that our graduates are well prepared and well integrated into Indiana's workforce. Uh, someone representing higher education, I would suggest that it's becoming increasingly more important for institutions like mine to be ever more nimble in responding to the dynamics of a very, very fast changing marketplace and the needs of our employers in a globally competitive environment. About 13 or 12 days ago, we had a commencement for IUP at Lucas Oil Stadium. We have 6,717 students graduate this year from IUPUI, and 90% of them stay in Indiana and work in Indiana and get engaged in Indiana. They, the reason for that, the two reasons, one is the nature of this particular campus, the professional programs, but the other reason is, remember these numbers, 200, 500, 8,000. We have 200 faculty staff that are constantly engaged with industry. We have 500 partners near and far, and we have 8,000 students this year alone that are in some kind of an experiential learning working in industry. And that is one of the reasons that they can find jobs, stay here, and contribute to economic development. Of course, all of us from university, we are working on degrees not for what we need today, but for what this state needs 10 years from now. I believe that we are on the threshold of what someday will be known as the biomedical century. And the Indiana life sciences sector is going to play a very important part in that. To realize this vast potential, we must deepen our commitment to strengthening Indiana's innovation ecosystem, forging new and better industry university partnerships, and encouraging and ensuring that Indiana college graduates are fully prepared for rewarding careers in the life sciences. First, we must continue to advance trusted and productive partnerships between companies and academic institutions. Second, we must continue to attract, engage, inspire, and retain talented people. And third, we must cultivate what I call our genius for innovation by investing in STEM education and ultimately in our future scientists, discoverers, and innovators. Creating medicines that will meet the most urgent health needs of today and tomorrow depends on a strong and well-supported innovation ecosystem. Our state's universities are a key element to this. Our company looks to great universities to develop the talent we need to accomplish our mission. And we seek to collaborate with the tremendous pool of talent in our universities as we advance innovation, to develop new ways to work closely with academic scientists on research of common interest. We have a long heritage of productive partnerships with academia. Two of our most historic at Lilly are the collaboration with the University of Toronto's dating back to the 1920s, which led to the introduction of insulin, something we're quite proud of. And later, the 1950s, the production of a polio vaccine based on the work of Dr. Jonas Salk at the University of Pittsburgh. If history has taught us anything, and I believe we need to learn a lot from history, it's that innovation can thrive when we develop collaborative relationships that break down barriers between scientists and industry and in academia. An educated, engaged, and inspired workforce is the lifeblood of Indiana's life sciences hub. Developing medicines is a long, laborious, and sometimes quite complex process. A massive effort that requires a decade or more and hundreds of millions of dollars. It also demands a wide range of expertise as potential medicines move through the development process. At Lilly, when we recruit and assess talent, access talent across our enterprise, we first want people who share our core values, integrity, excellence, and respect for people. Embracing diversity is at the core 
of our long-held value of respect for people. It is a lens through which we understand and respond to the unique needs of the millions and millions of individuals who depend on our medicines. Beyond our core values, we look for candidates who are learning agile, who learn readily from their experiences and apply that knowledge. Learning agility is highly correlated with leadership potential. In our industry, we need people who not only have deep knowledge in their own fields, but also the ability to work with others from different disciplines and from different backgrounds to seek and connect knowledge across a broad network, both inside and outside our company. These qualities are essential, not just for scientists, but for the whole gamut of responsibilities throughout our company. We want candidates who can boldly live out our leadership principles of connecting with people, being determined, and driving continuous improvement. Bold leadership can change lives, change communities, even change the course of history. The best leaders are determined to make a difference. They pursue goals with tenacity, grit, and courage. They envisage what's possible and pursue it with great confidence. These are the leaders we are looking for. One key to our effort to recruit and retain talented employees is to have a better understanding of millennials who will make up 50% of the workforce in 2020. It's not very far away. Research reveals what motivates potential employees in this age group. They want to contribute meaningful ways immediately. They don't want to wait. They are inspired and engaged with causes that help people, not institutions. They want to work with exciting and innovative companies. Our own research inside our company adds a few more insights. Work-life balance is very important. Good early work experiences matter, particularly internships when we're in the recruiting process. One of the reasons why we try so much to make sure we provide a world-class experience at Lilly. And high value is placed on involvement in the community. People want to be a part of something much bigger than themselves. Luckily, this is a strong part of our heritage dating back to our founder. Another important element in attracting and retaining talented people is ensuring that Indiana's business environment remains favorable to new and existing businesses and supports the creation of good jobs. Given that a quarter of our workforce, along with our global headquarters and largest research and development footprint, are here in Indiana, we care deeply about how our state is perceived as a place to both live and to work. This is critically important as we seek to recruit and retain the very best talent from our Indiana colleges, but also from around the world. As a company built on scientific discovery, we recognize the critical role that early education in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics plays in preparing children for careers in STEM fields. No matter how good our universities are, if we wait until college to develop interest and skills in STEM, is far too late. If we are to maintain Indiana's leadership position in the life sciences and accelerate growth, then our strategy to attract and retain talented people must begin with a focus on better educating our own citizens. Basic comprehension of math and science is essential, first of all, so that young people across Indiana have an opportunity to participate at any level in the high-tech economy of the future. As the technology sector grows and the baby boom generation retires, we need a very large cohort of people with basic scientific skills to fill in behind their parents and their grandparents. The future holds great promise in terms of biomedical innovation. We believe that diseases that have plagued us for generations, things like cancer, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, just to name a few, will indeed be conquered in the coming decades. Industry and academia must continue to work together to develop talent and drive innovation that serves society here in our home state of Indiana and across the globe.
You know, here in Indiana, Governor Pence and I worked so hard, we made it our number one uh, goal to bring jobs and grow jobs in Indiana. And so three and a half years in, we've added 140,000 jobs in Indiana, which is a great story to tell. More jobs than ever before. The tough part of that, if you're the employer, Dan Peterson and Cook, you know how difficult it now is to find employees. In fact, just two days ago, I had a C the CEO of a small engineering firm here in Indianapolis in my office, and she said, man, I can't find civil engineers anywhere. It's so hard, what can I do? And we started talking about how do you recruit? But that's the challenge we're in now, is to find those, that skilled workforce, those professional degrees, et cetera. And that range from computer science and information technology to all the healthcare fields, to advanced manufacturing and even aerospace, depending where you are in the state of Indiana. About 65% of our new jobs in Indiana are gonna require some post-secondary training. And that will be a two-year degree, four-year degree, or a certification of some sort. So knowing that, that's like a million more degrees, a million more credentials. Um, and we know that uh, for the space that Ivy Tech's in and Vincennes, a lot of those, half or more, will be in that two-year or less space. But that's still nearly half a million more more. So if you're in the four-year space, that's a lot too. So there's a lot for all of us in this room to figure out. And the big goal is that across the state, our goal is 60% of who's your workforce, who's your workers having a post-secondary credential or degree by 2025. That's scary. That's a lot of work. We're at about 41, almost 42% when you add the credentials in and that almost 20% gap. So we'll, knowing that, we began to look with that strategic plan, what did we need to do? And certainly a part of that, a big part of that is the alignment uh, to what you as employers need. And that includes getting the counseling right in the schools. How do we make sure that uh, counselors know what those are? But let's go to the first, which is, um, how do we know what that true demand is? And today we really don't have, we have BLS data, we have things like that, the top jobs kind of stuff, but we really don't know, it's, it's interesting, in 2016, we really don't know how many of each job we need. So the General Assembly has tasked DWD, Department of Workforce Development, to create a system that will measure those numbers of jobs uh, both immediately today, one year, three years, five years out. It's called DDWS. It will eventually measure 800 job titles and the skills that go with them statewide and regionally. That data will start rolling out late this summer and then it will be our task as institutions to make sure that we are serving that need in Indiana. Right now, and I'll speak for Ivy Tech, I'm not sure how your other institutions do it, we look at, are our programs full? And if they're full, then they must be demand. Well, maybe, but if you're the student and you graduate and you can't get a job, that wasn't the right place for you to be, right? And there may be programs that have twice the demand for you as employers, and they're only a quarter full. Then we have to go in recruiting mode. So there, that, information will be incredibly important in figuring out how we go forward and how we line up our programs. My view with Ivy Tech is we need to be 100% aligned with our employers because that's where our graduates will go. That's, they're gonna serve you in, as employers across the state. They will be working in your organization. So we have some work to do. We really have to continue to partner up in every way, shape, and form. I've, said if you listen to some of my interviews you may hear me say i would like employers in the room day one i'm not kidding about that i really would like you in the room day one to talk to students so they get an understanding on the first day why they're there and what opportunities are out there and how important it is that they're successful uh, i'm going to give you the same um, offer that if i can ever come into your place to help in any way support you and your workforce endeavors, uh, happy to be there and open up my entire team to be, to do that as well.
we target top candidates from partner colleges into pre-identified positions. And there's a word on this slide that isn't intentional. So the first thing is top candidates. We are not actually in the market for average to below average talent. We're in the market for the top talent. Um, talent is probably the only thing that in today's market differentiates a company. You can buy anything else. You can buy tools, you can buy equipment, you can buy machinery, you can license products and technology. The real competitive advantage is the quality of your talent and how effectively you can have that talent working together. So we want the top talent from partner schools um, as, a, as a core underpinning and as the primary pipeline for our talent. Our primary selection process at partner schools is testing for core values and performance skills alignment. And that's just really important and it'll tie in with what we need from universities. Because having a great engineer that does not understand nor value diversity, can't work flexibly, doesn't have self-motivation and critical thinking skills, isn't flexible and collaborative, is not gonna work for us. So we're looking for a real fit with our core values. 56% of the professional hiring we do comes from uh, college level recruitment. 56% uh, of that uh, comes from intern conversions. So internships are really important. It's kind of like a long job interview and we really get to see whether the core values are in place or not in place. 25% of our college hiring requires sponsorship. So 25% of all the college hires we, we place at an undergraduate, graduate, um, or PhD level are foreign national students completing their degrees in the US and we pay for and completely sponsor their visa process and their green card process. And uh, there's lots of reasons for that. One is diversity really matters and global diversity matters. And the second thing is uh, if you do a lot of advanced engineering STEM hiring, I'm sure for those of you that are educators and are in top programs, um, the fact of the matter is we're not doing a good enough job of getting American women and American citizens on a STEM path. But there are lots of people all over the world who recognize the world-class education we offer, and the net result is it flows through to Cummins as a diverse talent pipeline. But we shouldn't miss the fact that we are leaving women on the sidelines still in many career areas. We're leaving U.S. minorities on the sideline in many career areas and disciplines, and we need to find a way to dig deeper and get those talented people engaged in STEM education and STEM careers much earlier. So we've gotta get pretty serious about this. If you look at the global statistics and numbers, aging demographics and workforces, you know, China and India, for example, graduating millions of engineers per year, millions. And it makes our US engineering population pale in comparison. So we have, from a competitive perspective, from a replacing our baby boomers as they move into retirement, from a long-term competitiveness perspective, we have a lot more investment to make here. Um, as you look at selection and onboarding, one of the questions is what are we doing to, to adjust or to make sure we're successful in transitioning students from college to employment, especially in the millennial age. But you know, the first thing is, as I mentioned, selection for core values. The second thing is, you know, we have, as a company, um, really moved away at college hiring from having hiring managers actually making hiring decisions. Hiring managers in our organization are the recipients of talent. We use what are called talent scouts, or individuals that are increasingly trained and capable and recognized as being strong talent pickers to go and help assess all of the talent, pick the best ones, and bring it back to our organization. So skills, so what are some of the skill areas that are changing? I think you can, you can uh, read as well as I can. None of this, I think, is, is hugely surprising. I think we could have stood here five years ago or three years ago or even 10 years ago, and I'm sure as educators, you're, you're increasingly tired of hearing the same you know, old story, but the fact of the matter is, is that these kind of challenges, um, working in highly collaborative environments, constant changes, reprioritization, reshuffling what we need to do to support our customers, working in tremendously diverse teams in a global framework, demands a different set of performance skills than maybe were demanded 10 or 20 years ago. You know, one of the big changes that I see 
um, since I joined the company more than 20 years ago, is, you know, I think in those days, you know, we were a little bit more of a siloed organization, more compartmentalized. You kind of came in, you had a job, you worked with a team. You generally sat with the team that you worked with in the same building, in the same room, in the same area, um, you know, and, and there was more continuity. As we seek to really effectively manage our human capital, our talent, our capacity, and as our customer needs are shifting and changing, there's just much more dynamic environment as we're trying to leverage all the skills and capabilities that we have. Employees are no longer as co-located as they once were. We're working through technology, we're working through Skype, through video teleconferences. Lots of work is now globally dispersed because it can be. It's not at all unusual for a team that's doing technical work for a US engine platform to have experts all over the world. It's not unusual for these college hires to be attached to those teams solving those problems. Figuring out in a given day, I have a telecom with Australia at six o'clock in the morning, and at midnight I need to do something with China, and in the meantime I've got three other meetings, and I've got people that are with me, and people in different areas, and how can I be successful and effective in that environment? And oh, by the way, our, our team just rebalanced its work priorities, given our latest customer demand, or our cost reduction work, or whatever the case may be. The things I was working on a month ago, we're gonna shift focus and work on other things. How do I stay engaged and motivated and be able to operate in that environment? Those are just simple examples of some of the kinds of challenges we have. And are just in the process, in fact, this initiative does not yet have a name, but it will shortly for the brand. Uh, we are in the process of starting something that is today known as the Central Indiana Workforce Development Initiative. It is sector agnostic by design. Uh, it is really designed to focus on this region. It is designed to bring the CEOs and the university and college presidents together. Uh, it looks at both associate degree issues and uh, baccalaureate and beyond issues. And it's trying to figure out why we have such a growing gap in the ability to feed the industry that we already have here in our technologically intensive companies. And frankly, all of our successful companies today are technologically intensive in one way or another. All of them are having shortages and problems in being able to recruit the kinds of talent they need, whether it's right out of college or whether it's in, in, in later career. Uh, and we are really trying to find out what those issues are, whether they are sector specific, whether they are occupation specific, uh, and to work company by company, higher ed institution by higher ed institution to really begin to deliver some, uh, uh, some retail solutions. We're smack dab in the middle of the automotive manufacturing environment, and so uh, we have to respond to that. So part of it is, as regional campuses of Indiana University, each and every one of us have taken on as our primary mission to be a steward of place. We have to be sure that we're on the ground, that we're listening to the communities that we serve, and that we're responding to those communities with the needs they have. So for example, um, we serve Chrysler Corporation. Uh, four of its largest plants are in Kokomo, Indiana. We produce just about every transmission in the country there. And uh, when Sergio Marchione, who's the CEO of Chrysler Corporation, was on our campus a couple of years ago, I asked him exactly this question, what is it that you need? And he said to me, Susan, you need to produce leaders, which is exactly what we just heard a little earlier than that. Um, these students, no matter whether they're English majors or communication majors or uh, engineers, um, we're, we'll take all of them, but they need to be leaders. And then second of all, he reiterated, which I think is also very uh, key to what we just heard, is we need global leaders. And you're not producing students who have the global competencies that are necessary. And so in, in the middle of Indiana, we have students that come from very rural backgrounds, at least that surround me, and they're not um, ready to work in a global environment, just like our keynote speaker said. You know, they come from a small community. They've never seen an African American a person. Uh, they don't have a sense of what it means to deal with people who come from a variety of different cultures and countries. And so um, what we're doing at Indiana University of Kokomo is to be that steward of place. We're trying to identify problems that are experienced in our communities and then to put our students out there trying to solve those problems with solutions. Uh, number two is delivering a curriculum that provides students with those skill sets. And so we have focused mostly on high impact practices, trying to develop a curriculum that comes around those high impact practices, 
As you know, the research is very clear uh, that in order for a student to come out with some deep learning and applied learning, they need to be engaged in three to five high impact practices minimum during their college career. What I mean by that is undergraduate research, internships, practicums, applied learning, applied projects, all of those kinds of things. And so we've tried to infuse that into curriculum and we're trying to guarantee, I know the IUPUI campus has a program called RISE where they try to guarantee that students have X number of high impact practices. Uh, what I'm most concerned about are the students who don't know how to negotiate high impact practices. So your first generation college students, uh, your low income students who come to campus and simply don't have an idea of how do you ask a professor to be involved in an undergraduate research project. So we have to integrate it into the curriculum so that every student has that opportunity. If we are going to raise our regions up, if we're going to raise this state up, it has to be for every student. And regional campuses have a tendency to be able to attract a variety of different prepared students. Well, every, I went out to visit 24 different CEOs across Indiana, and all of them said they thought that internship opportunities were about, very valuable in terms of that transition uh, to business, um, meaningful internship opportunities. Um, so thus, colleges can't wait. I think we have the assumption that we can wait we have four years, we'll get them prepared, we'll get them out there, and they'll be ready to go into industry. Um, if companies have expectations of their interns, and so if you're sending <coughs> sophomores out there, you better make sure you have a plan in place and a program in place that starts that development. With Wabash College, we tied our, our, our student employment program is the first phase of our career development program. And so the students have to develop what we call a starter profile, which is their resume that goes into our career development uh, system. Um, so that that's their first resume that gets turned over to our career professionals. Um, those students use it for the job interview because we expect them to do that. We expect meaningful uh, guidance and direction and mentorship from our uh, employers. And so we're trying to make sure those soft skill development things are happening early in the process so that they're ready to go and hit the ground running for their internship because um, the internet had a, had a program, a brochure out there that talked about, you know, 63% of the companies hire those students who intern for them. The other thing is I think uh, Steve brought this up as well, <coughs> preparing our students for this. Um, he talked about diversity and, and I was going to speak to the value of difference, understanding and appreciating value and differences. Um, you know, I reminded my friends at DePauw. I said, you know, had I not been the one who got up from my table and walked over and introduced myself, we would not be friends today. I said, don't let that happen to your kids. You know, it doesn't matter if you live in a fraternity or residence hall, whatever. You have to make sure that you're understanding that in this global world, uh, you better be prepared to appreciate the value of those around you. I remind these young men that I work with every day at Wabash College that. I said, you better be prepared and understand gender and value difference in gender and, and things like that. Because I said, when you go out and you're, I'd hate to be the one or I'd be in your shoes when your first boss is a woman and you're not prepared. You don't appreciate it, you don't value it, you don't expect them to be as smart as you. I said, and I hope she's black. <laughs> and they fell out of their chair because I knew they wouldn't be ready for that. Right? So don't let that be the first time that you really appreciate the value of women uh, when your boss is going to be or you're in an interview setting, or the first time that you interact with someone who's different from you. Uh, but we are Indiana's central resource for anything internships, resources, connections. Uh, we have a free internship matching system that works with all Indiana employers or internships in Indiana, uh, all the colleges and universities, and with anybody seeking an internship. Through that program, we're able to offer uh, internships uh, and connections to all the students in the state. Uh, when I look at our website, indianintern.net, a few days ago we had almost 7,000 employers on the site. We had over 14,000 active students on the site. And right now, because we're coming upon summer, uh, the number of internships available continues, it goes down as we're filling them, but there are about 700 of those. One of the things that I have seen recently is more alignment of resources within the state. Everyone is doing great work in this arena. We work with all of you. But I'm seeing the Indiana Career Council set a goal of 10,000 new internships, uh, work and learn experiences in terms of looking at our talent retention in our state. The Commission for Higher Education is working closely with Indiana Internet. 
We recently partnered with IUPUI. I'm very excited about this program where we've actually been pushing the internships from our website to their website. We know that employers have said they would like a central portal instead of posting on all of the websites. We know that the schools have told us sometimes they're taking them off our websites and putting them on theirs because they're trying to provide the access for their students. And we know that the students benefit. And so by doing this, this has been a great experience. We're hoping to do this with other schools. Uh, we've tracked some of the results with IUPUI. We know that since December, we've actually pushed over 700 internships to them. Of those 350 plus, were actually unique, not duplicates of other internships on their website. And uh, as a result, they've tracked the numbers of those students from their site who have actually gotten internships through this connection. And so we're not, we're not a name that a lot of people know unless you're really familiar with the industry. If you're in biomedical engineering programs on campuses, you, you know, we're, we're like a household name, but if you're in finance, you're in you know, different areas, um, especially at the collegiate level, you don't necessarily know about Zimmer Biomed or Orsa Indiana. The reason I say that is for those of you who are familiar with it, we call ourselves the orthopedic capital of the world. So prior to the merger of Zimmer and Biomed last year, we had three of the major players in the, the orthopedic musculoskeletal space headquartered in Orsa Indiana. Now you have Zimmer Biomed as well as DePuy Synthes. Sometimes we need to work a lot harder to, to get those college students because they just don't know about us. They see our displays on campus and they see some weird looking things on a banner and it's our product, but if they're not familiar with that, if they're not in that biomedical engineering or mechanical engineering space, they might have no idea what it is and they'll walk right on past. So what we do, uh, you know, a couple of things. Um, we target schools in the Midwest to find talent. Um, and we do a lot with with co-op and internship programs. So we, we generally have somewhere between 75 and 100 co-ops and interns at any given point throughout throughout the year. And we have co-op programs that run um, you know, year round, uh, three different sessions, spring, summer, and fall. Um, so one is, is bringing that talent in early. Another thing that we do is, you know, when we're looking at that talent, if I'm, if I'm trying to recruit somebody from the Kelly School of Business down at IU, and they're from New York City. They've obviously, you know, on their resume, they've lived in New York City their whole life. There's probably not a great chance that person is going to want to come and be comfortable in Warsaw, Indiana. So I might look at somebody who's maybe from the Midwest. Um, you know, if I can tell that from from their resume, that's going to be more attractive to me because I know we have a better chance of landing that candidate. Partnering with schools, you know, trying to get our alumni out to campuses to um, speak at different events. I know I had the opportunity to go down to Ball State a couple of weeks ago and speak at a limited business event. Um, we have people that go to events on their campuses. The more you can get your name out, um, obviously, is going to help us. And then another major thing that we've been doing is partnering with OrthoWorks, um, in, which is in uh, Warsaw. And that was really an organization you know, founded out of this, um, this idea that we need to keep talent in Indiana. We need to bring talent into um, into Warsaw, into the orthopedic industry. And so we've been doing a lot of neat things with them. Early career development programs where um, we have groups, you know, finance, operations, quality, HR, um, where we have early career development programs where we're bringing that talent in, um, you know, on top of maybe your other entry level engineer type role, but specific programs um, that are geared to help fast track people because again, that's gonna be attractive, especially to this generation that is so used to everything happening very quick. Higher education obviously brings with it, and one of its great values is that it provides specific knowledge and specific skills for somebody's next job. We also know that somebody's next job today um, is not the last job they will have, and we often like to say it's not the last career uh, that they will have. And so one of the ways in which higher education can support the state uh, and support employment and employers in the state is to focus on the more fundamental knowledge and skills that will support students through multiple jobs and multiple careers. Things like critical thinking, careful analysis, 
uh, perceptive reading, problem solving, working productively with other people, the appreciation of diversity in, um, and genuine inclusion um, of people with other perspectives, with other backgrounds, from other cultures. The related subject of having a uh, workforce, having individuals with global experience and openness to the rest of the world. The ability to adapt to new information and new conditions. Having a strong ethical com uh, compass and the awareness of the needs of others. Uh, and maybe the uh, most important one, at least from my perspective, is knowing how to learn and having a passion for learning that will serve not only now but for a lifetime. Uh, just because they're called soft skills doesn't mean that they're easy to get. In fact, soft skills are some of the most difficult to get. They require practice. They require watching and modeling. Um, they're not obtained in one class. They're often not obtained very directly. Um, and they're not obtained just in class. They're part of the larger experience of higher education. And one of the reasons why the models of higher education uh, in this country, the tr more traditional models, I think still have enormous value because they're very good at conveying this whole range of so-called soft skills. And I think that if those of us in the room uh, reflect on this, and certainly our panel and speakers made this very clear, that these are the skills that are the differentiators for students. Uh, you can find people with lots of knowledge, but can you find them with those kinds of skills? That's harder to do. While we focus today um, on STEM disciplines, science and technology, that's part of the econ that's partly because of the economy of Indiana. It's partly because uh, of the marvelous uh, partners uh, who have joined us today. Um, that's not the only place that these skills are learned. Um, an effective E2E strategy is going to include lots of disciplines, uh, including the traditional liberal arts disciplines, whose students um, learn and practice those kinds of skills all the time in lots of different ways. Um, I may be one of the most important uh, that struck me is the ability to move across domains of knowledge. Uh, that was something that Cummins values. We heard that Lilly values uh, those. I know lots of industries um, value that ability. We sometimes call it problem solving to pull from many different places. Again, that is one of the classic uh, liberal arts skills and one that those of us who grew up in that tradition uh, are, very, uh, are very proud of. So I would like to challenge all of us um, as we think more about education to employment, uh, generally, whether it is in the context of these, uh, these convenings um, or in other contexts, to think broadly about the disciplines to which this applies and how do we bring those liberal arts majors into this conversation? Because I think that there is a huge untapped resource uh, that, we can, uh, that we can use and for the great benefit of the state and for uh, the great benefit of the, of the people of the state. Commencement season is, uh, is just concluded, uh, for the record. I went to eight of them. Um, I think I even beat President McGrawdy this year. Um, and at commencement, one of the things that people often do is think about the word commencement. And it sounds like a cliche to do that, but it's actually a really great idea because commencement, I am told, is a fairly unusual phrase uh, for graduation. That is unusual in terms of other uh, countries' uh, terminology for this. And of course, what commencement means is that it's a beginning. It's not just the end of something. I think you can apply the same sort of rhetorical uh, trope, as they would say, um, to thinking about what convergence, what we're doing, 
uh, literally means. Um, in fact, I think that commencement and convergence are actually rather, uh, rather closely related. That is, just as careers, as we've said uh, again and again today, um, ought not to begin, uh, s simply begin at commencement, education can't stop there. And so if you'll uh, forgive sort of, I like to think of it as Stone Age PowerPoint, if you have education coming along here and your career coming along here, the traditional view of commencement is that education ends here and the career begins here. Well, one thing we know from today is that doesn't work so well. We need to have students thinking about careers a little in advance of that, a little in advance of their commencement, so they need to overlap. I guess I'd also like to make the case that, the, um, that education can't stop there as well. We talked a little uh, today about apprenticeship and onboarding and all the work that many enterprises do to teach and continue teaching um, the people who work for them. Some of it is very explicit education and training. Others is simply working them uh, or helping them to advance in the organization in a fairly systematic way. So just as, um, just as careers uh, need to begin before commencement, education needs to continue after them. So they overlap and in that sense they converge.